What is up, Notre Dame fans? Mike Singer from BlueAndGold.com with our football analyst, Tim Hyde. We are live. We're getting going here at about, what, 8 p.m. Eastern time on Wednesday night. Um, we are down one person. Ashton Pollard is on a beach somewhere in North Carolina. She's on vacation having herself a good time. So uh, Tim Hyde and myself will hold it down. Uh, appreciate you guys joining us live or watching back. Make sure you hit the thumbs up on this video to support what we're doing here at blueandgold.com. Subscribe to our channel if you have not done so yet. And of course, head to blueandgold.com, $1 for one year of premium access. Great time to sign up still. So Tim, what's going on, my man? What, what's new in your world? Yeah, what's well, not new in the world? A beautiful fourth. Hope everyone had a great fourth of July. Uh, had a beautiful time up here at the lake in New England and uh, had an awesome time. So it's been a, a whirlwind. Notre Dame news, I, what has been a uh, nonstop <laughs> recruiting. And where the heck is Notre Dame going to play football in the future? We'll find out, right? Crazy times. Other than that, life is awesome. Yep, we will. Uh... Probably not find out anything soon. I, I I don't imagine that anything is going to be. I don't know. I mean, yeah. it seems like all of the national talking heads are are, are saying that uh, that this thing is uh, Notre Dame's likely going to stay in the uh, independence um, ranks. Sorry, I got we're we're doing a new um, broadcasting platform called Streamyard, so kind of getting used to it. It's 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 sharp and. Pretty cool. Um, but a um, couple comments already. Josh says, Tim Hyde, sharpest dressed man in the Notre Dame reporting business. My man, let's go Irish. Yeah. Cheers. Yeah. We, I mean, we always did the, you know, after the, after the, after the games, you know, the shirt and tie. And yeah, I just, it's live. I don't know why. It's just live. I turned into a lounge, a lounge singer now. So there you go. You know, you just, uh, you're, you're always on game. Why, why don't you show us the pants, Tim? Yeah. The pants are good. They're, they're pressed, ready to go. Got a good steam <laughs> going. <laughs> Oh man, I walked out to get a glass of water today and I had done a, we did a video um, with JD Pickell on three national analysts. And I, I think I'd like my, it's like a Carolina blue colored shirt and like the shorts I were wearing, like, like a burnt orange almost. I looked ridiculous and my wife, she, uh, she chuckled at me. Um, so yeah, we all can't it's look at like Tim all the time. Charlie Weiss, his last belt loop says, what's up? Robbie's asking for his hat. Hey man. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm told the, the, the founders club hat or it's still hap. I mean, it's happening. It's just, we're just not hundred percent sure when. So if you signed up uh, for blue and gold.com, I think it was in the first couple of months yep. um, of, after we moved on three, you're in that founders club. Um, but yeah, that, that still should be on this summer. All right, Tim, what, what do you, what are you sipping on? You got a, you got a beer, a beer, got a beer, a uh, harpoon, one of my favorite breweries out of Boston. And, uh, after skipping last week, I went with our good Notre Dame friends over at Two Tigers. Cheers, everybody. Yeah, I got to say, I um, finished all my Two Tigers. I think I've got um, the, the spice the core left, but otherwise I, I've gone through my uh, Two Tigers. I got a, a Topo Chico a Tropical Mango. Love it. Um, man, we got a super chat already from JoJo. Appreciate it. He says, oh. Oh man, let's um, I, now let's just yeah. get right into it. Yeah, let's just get right into it. Um <laughs> Jojo asks, can you guys tell me how Notre Dame and Dante fell apart or was it NIL? Notre Dame should have known better or Dante's camp was not honest. Mm. Um, Jojo, Jojo. Yeah. So, yeah, it does appear that Oregon is the team to beat and, and should be getting them soon. Um, you know, like on our, our loose emoji message board at Blue and Gold, there's been Notre Dame fans who are um, – you know, guessing what, what's going on and, and, you know, what, what kind of happened. And I'm, I'm not going to lie. It's, it's, it's a lot of it's pretty accurate. Of course, a lot of it's not accurate, but a lot of it is. Um, I mean, look, he, he, Dante Moore was very, very close to being on Notre Dame's commitment list. And as time went on, things just, just kind of faded away. And that's kind of the short and sweet answer to it. You know, the, the, whether it was NIL, I mean, uh, I'm not going to – like, I don't really like to get into reporting on, well, this kid isn't going to commit to Notre Dame because of his grades. Like, that's – I mean, that that's just kind of weird reporting 
on 17, 18 year old kids. The NIL thing, like I'm, you know, to report on that and recruiting and that, that you know, that's that's none of my business. That's none of y'all's business either. Um, but to my knowledge, like Dante is not like NIL driven, but you know, it just seemed to shift away from Notre Dame when they took CJ Carr's commitment. And, um, you know, if I'm Notre Dame, I'm taking CJ Carr seven days of the week. Take the thing that's a sure thing over than what you might be able to get. Uh, And CJ Carr, at the end of the day, might be a better quarterback than Dante Moore. So, and and, any thoughts there, Tim? No, I mean, it's been a, it's been a whirlwind. You know, we were obviously, you know, you put in the prediction way back when, when things were, we don't need to talk about that. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's a live show. So, but uh, no, you're right. And then he came up, he had the two day visit, you know, the hoopla, everyone, you know, ready to roll. Everyone thought he was going to be committing. And then it's like, now I'm going to go take, you know, I'm going to go visit every school I can basically. And it was, that's for me, that's when I said, oh, he's, you know, if he's coming to ND, it's going to be interesting. And then. I went back over the last, I think it's 20, 21 quarterbacks. And I wrote down, I mean, 16, you know, basically the last 20, 16 out of the last 20 quarterbacks have committed before the 4th of July for Notre Dame over the last, you know, 20 years. And when he said he was going to drag this thing on, it, 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 it was not good for Notre Dame, especially historically, because the ones that didn't commit are the ones they flipped. Gunnar Keel, Brandon Wimbush guys of that nature down the road. Um, and then two guys during the Willingham years, but uh, yeah, I mean, you can see the right on the wall. It's for 2023. You need a quarterback because that quarterback room is uh, interesting to say the least. You know, we could get into this another show, just the plan B. What was it? it, it I mean, we, you, you and I have talked about all in on Dante. That was the philosophy. And, but once they realized it wasn't going to work, was it skip this year? And then CJ Carr is the guy. So that's uh 2023 may just go without a QB. And then no, no. they're going to take a quarterback. They're going to take it. Yeah. But yeah. But that's going to be interesting. What quarterback wants to come knowing CJ Carr's there. So obviously it's a plan. Uh, B. I QB. mean, look at all the plan B program. QB. I mean, look yeah. at Arch Manning. Uh, I mean, it, it, Quinn Ewers just got there. I mean, Cade Klubnick yeah. following DJ young lit. I mean, I, but, I don't. Yeah, but the but that's easier for Arch. He's going to go there next year. It's going to be Quinn's junior year. So if Quinn's the dude, he could leave. Arch could learn the system, blah, 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 and then be the guy. I mean, Chase Young, Chase Young, geez, Bryce Young. We're talking about Jason Moore earlier, everybody. But Bryce, Bryce Young, he played as much as you and I as a freshman, wins the Heisman. So not every blue chip five-star comes in and starts right away as a true freshman. Uh, Arch is in a perfect situation. A lot of these quarterbacks are in perfect situations. So um, it's just interesting how Notre Dame, they just, they, you just can't close on those, the big ones. They are getting CJ now. So 2024 hopefully starts a different type of a uh, role here for the Irish. Yeah. I, I, I agree with you, but for all these big time quarterbacks, I think we've got to kind of get away from the, um, you know, not following another guy because if colleges have to take a quarterback, like a big time quarterback every year because so many of them transfer. So you got to keep bringing them in because you're, you're, you're going to have. No, I, I agree. And, I then, agree. and then what do you do on the other end of it? Like uh, start skipping a class. So guys don't transfer. Well, there's still, there's still transfer. Or if you get hurt, you know, then you're one play away from starting a true freshman or something. So, well, you know, I, you know, let me just do a little sidebar off of that. I mean, what, you know, to be brutally honest here, a beautiful live show here on a Wednesday night, what five-star 2023 quarterback wants to come to Notre Dame with the wide receiver room it has? I mean, right? Who, it's I mean, who are they going to be throwing to? It's getting better. This 2023 classes, I mean. True. A couple good ones. But it's a lot of, but it's a lot of freshmen. There's not dudes ready to roll. I'm just, I'm just throwing that out there. But, you know, was that something out there? Because one of Dante's quotes at his seven, one of the seven on sevens was, he wanted to see the offense. He wanted to see what these teams were going to be doing. So, the fact that he's committing, he's obviously reneging on that little thing he said on a seven on one of those weekends. But um, hey, he's going to a first time head football coach. I, I find that interesting. So, um, you know, he. Uh, you know, he's going to coach Landing, who's never been a head coach, just like Marcus Freeman. So 
it's putting all his eggs in a brand new basket, not knowing what's out there. So I think that's interesting. So I, I, I'm enjoying this. This Jojo, yeah. you got you, you, that super going. chat you dropped in. That's you got your your bang for your buck there. We definitely appreciate the super chat. Anyone else? I mean, t- Tim and I are. I mean, we have some things we want to discuss, but we're for the lack of a better time, we're winging it. We're we're just we're just kind of going with the flow for this show. So you have this super chat, and you got something you really want us to discuss. Drop it, and uh, we'll, we'll get to it. Um, I do want to note for folks listening on podcast. First of all, you know I love you, but you know I'm frustrated with you because you should be on YouTube. You know, but I understand some people just don't have the time. I get it. If you're ever wondering why those WSBT hits are not on radio or are not on our podcast anymore, when I'd be talking with Darren Pritchett, we started doing those as videos and I clipped them up into a couple different segments. And um, so I just kind of put the more of our focus on YouTube because be honest with you, we make more money than you. I don't even know if we make money on podcasts. This, this is not a big, I mean, we have plenty of podcast listeners, but it's not, you know, YouTube's a much bigger platform for us. Okay. Couple of comments. Uh, we said we got a what's up, blue and gold. Go Irish, appreciate you joining. Um, Irish one says, Got blue and gold magazine since the late 80s. My dad turned me on to their great coverage for Notre Dame. Appreciate it. Um, all of our, um, well, no, Todd Burlich. I was forgetting about Todd. Um, and of course, Tim, but Tim's really just a video guy and message board. But like all of our four of our five writers are haven't weren't born in the late 80s, so we're trying to you know make this blue and gold product um as good as it was back then and um even better um let's see more comments irish one also says um no oh, this was his comment bama gets great quarterbacks every year socially i i i agree like yeah. you, you just go go try to get them every year um comment jackson arnold they should start calling asap don't see that one happening i don't think Notre Dame is going to be able to make a move for the uh, Oklahoma quarterback commit. Do feel like that has uh, that, that ship has sailed. Jackson, Jackson Arnold won the elite 11 competition uh, last weekend. I mean, they do like elite 11. It's it's like half based on your performance there and half yeah. still on your junior film. It's just the weirdest. It, okay. That's hey, that's down at my, uh, my, my high school alma mater, by the way. So one of the best facilities in the, in the country at Redondo uh, high school. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, they do a great job. They yeah, my job. my school alma mater, I think we our last Division One recruit was two thousand eight. <laughs> so, the running back who signed at USF didn't quite work out. But um, all right, best thing you've seen in the past week. I know we picked these about five minutes before we started recording. Um, but uh, yeah. Uh, well, I mean. Mine was a hey, Notre Dame after the nice run they just had recruiting wise. They were slipping Texas, what Bama, Ohio State, everyone jumping them. And then there's little Notre Dame, right? Getting right back up in the fray, holding on to number one once again. So um, it's hey, it's fun, you know, obviously signing days in December, but this is a battle royale. Look how tight the points are when you go to the score to the far right. It is a it's 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 a battle right now. But what's most impressive? is that Notre Dame has got so many four stars this year. Yeah. I mean, just, I mean, they're loaded, loaded up with, with four stars and um, it's a, it's a heck of a football class. Yeah. It's let's look at this team rankings breakdown chart. 84% of Notre Dame's commitments yeah. are, are four or five stars. Look at the average distance. This is on, uh, on our blue and gold front page under the team commitments tab. 834 miles um average different average excuse me average distance from where the recruit is to Notre Dame school you got Ohio State's at 759 Alabama's at 247 that's 500 or 600 miles less than Notre Dame that's Texas at 537 there. Georgia 385 um so it's like geez LSU 1,155. Uh, it's the, uh, it's the Long Beach, it's the Long Beach Poly kid, and they got a Minnesota guy, the Howard. But uh, the Long Beach Poly, Austin, and, the really good DB, messing it all in up. State. They got two in-state yeah. commitments. Yeah, I mean, we don't, <laughs> we don't want to turn this into Bayou Brian hour, but uh, I, you know what? That could be a best of the week. How uh, someone was breaking down the, the the recruiting of LSU on Twitter, and they I saw that how they only have a couple. Couple guys, I think in the top fifteen, only two Louisiana guys 
are more than likely going to commit to LSU. I found that just wild because that's yeah. – yeah. yeah, we got a couple comments um, asking about um, Ben Minnick, a, a safety recruit um, from Ohio. I will just say um, head to blueandgold.com, read this article. It's a dollar to read it, and then you get access to our site um, for the um, the next year. So just just go, just go do that. But um, all right. So the, Tim's best thing he saw was. Notre Dame with the uh, the number one class in the country. Mine, I'm going a, a little bit of a different route. It's more of a comedy route. I, I thought this tweet was was great from Reddit. Um, the ultimate flex would be Notre Dame poaching the top seven, eight teams from both the Big Ten and SEC and making their own super conference. Tim, would you be down for this? What would you think? I mean, yeah, you know what? There's no. I mean, I mean, you want to talk about a murderer's row schedule, right? That'd be a uh, that'd be pretty intense, right there. That'd be a uh, but, but the first one to six wins gets to move on. <laughs> they just beat the heck out of each other. That would be that'd be awesome. Yeah, there's all kinds of talk on Twitter about Notre Dame rallying these guys or rallying a bunch of conferences and forming their own conference. It's too much work. <laughs> too much work. It's, you sound like a. A father with a with an infant who's just exhausted, Tim. That's what you yeah. sound like right now. Is that accurate? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it, it is fascinating what's out there, but uh, you know, and, and you know, just real quick, it's you know, I, I know we'll talk about you know later on and whatnot, but this talk about these super conferences, and all I think about is poor Rutgers and Vander Clark Lee at Vanderbilt. It's like, good luck, guys. What the? Heck? I mean, Vanderbilt's like really. I mean, we, I mean, we got to play these guys. I mean, if they go to these super conferences and all this rumor about pushing Notre Dame out. So you're telling me Vanderbilt's going to play 12 SEC games a year. They're not going to survive. So, but uh, that's what I was thinking about when I saw those, the Maryland's and the Rutgers poor, poor guys. I mean, have fun. Yeah. I mean, have fun. They're going to be making a lot of money. So that's, that's good for them. But yeah, I was talking about it uh, with JD Pakel again. Um, Go check out that video on our uh, our blue and gold YouTube page. But I was like, man, just think about like the USC lacrosse team. <laughs> Got to go out to Maryland and vice versa. <laughs> like, goodness gracious. Like, that sucks. Great lacrosse at Maryland. But, uh, you know, that's – yeah, I was talking to one of my buddies back in Los Angeles. I have a guy who works for the – in the video department at USC, and we were chatting about that. And uh, it's like, are they going to do weekend tournaments? Is that what they're going to do? Because – I mean, I mean, I'm talking like softball, baseball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, so. is, are they going to go out to Penn State on a Tuesday, Wednesday and play softball? Or are they going to just host more stuff on the weekend? It's going to be fascinating yeah. with all this travel, the craziness. Well, I there. know when like Pac-12 basketball, like the mountain schools will like, you know, play the the, the like the L.A. schools and mm-hmm. they kind of just Thursday they, this team yep. plays and then Saturday. So they definitely will – be smart about the travel in those yeah. sports. But yeah, um, Tim, you know, I've been, uh, I got into Premier League soccer, um, football, I should say. Yeah. And I was reading about last year, some of the top teams in Europe tried to disband from the um, UEFA Champions League to make their own, where, and they were trying to form their own basically super conference. And I was like, man, does this sound very similar to what is going on right now? I mean, College football between the one-time transfer rule, which is fine. You know, it's not a big deal, but um, it's still something. I feel like that's just kind of gone under the radar, but with all the other things going on, NIL, yeah. the, oh, man, this uh, transfer portal, the coaching carousel off this offseason was as nutty as it's ever been, and then this conference realignment with geography being irrelevant, it's nuts right now, Tim. The, you know, and, you know, the coaching carousel, well, the coaching carousel is happening, as you know, because of the recruiting calendar, the early signing period. They're trying to jam a coach in. But still, how often exactly. does Lincoln, For a how couple weeks go from Oklahoma to USC and Notre Dame to LSU? Like, no, I, it, no exactly. It, 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 it was crazyville this year. Miami, you had Oregon, you had premier football programs with openings this year. And uh, the biggest thing that, you know, if you could talk, you know, name, image, likeness and all this, it's the transfer portal. That is the, the one-time transfer, you know, like you said, is the biggie because LSU, you know, USC, Michigan State this past season got into a New Year's Six Bowl. 
because they were able to load up with 20 transfers or whatever their number was. The fact that you could go out there and rebuild your program and then within a couple of weeks is the biggest thing for these programs that will take the transfers instead of like if Lincoln Riley went to USC right now, they would not be good for a few years because he would have to high school guys, get Juco players, things of that nature. But the fact that he could go get 25 guys within a couple months and rebuild his program, that is the biggest thing going on in college football for programs that need instant help. All right, we're 20 minutes in, and we've uh, not gotten to any of our segments yet other than the best thing you saw. So um, we're uh, we're doing great here, Tim. Um, we got a super chat from uh, Truman. Um, Truman says – Julius Caesar never begged to join any rival empire. So Truman is very much saying stay independent for folks with us live here or watching back. um, Drop us a comment. Are you team independent or are you on the team for Notre Dame joining a conference? You let me know. Um, I'm I'm, I'm curious. I wish I could like put up a poll. That would be a cool thing for, for the software to to do. Um, All right, Tim. So I'm going to call it a five for five run. Yep. Because going into, what was it, last Wednesday, there were five recruits who we knew had decision dates locked in. And then, um, uh, what's the young – Micah Tease ended up setting a commitment date as well for July 4th. He ended up at Arkansas. So, I'm, you know, that was a recruiting loss for Notre Dame. The Irish would have loved to have Micah Tease. Um, but, you know – for the for, for the sake of this, we're gonna say it was five for five because they landed those those players that we uh you know had those decision dates. Um, so we'll, we'll put them up on the screen in order. So you had Cam Williams committed to the Irish on the 29th of June. Charles Jagusaw was the next morning. You got Micah Bell the next evening. Rico Flores on Sunday. So we skipped Saturday. Mike Singer had a day off, which was very nice. <laughs> and then uh, Christian Gray on uh on independence day um speaking of independence here's the the comments we've got we've got independent two for independent three for independent four for independent five six and seven just one for conference we will get to tim's opinion and I'll, i'll chime in a little bit later let's talk some recruiting though of these five again gray flores bell Jaggy saw Cam Williams, which is the most important. Let's let's phrase it as that most important commitments of this uh, of this quintet. Yeah, I mean you got some good good football players. Obviously, you know poor Cam won't be here for uh, for a while. So we love you, Cam. He's a heck of a wide receiver. But for most importance, I'm thinking. 2023, 2024, early, early in their career. Who's going to be able to match up with the Buckeyes and AM's coming on the schedule? What, uh, 24? Miami's coming on soon. It's for me, it's Christian Gray. Yeah. The fact that they got a top 100 corner, which as you and I talked about before, hasn't happened in ages. So, did you look up some data on that? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, they've had a couple of top 100 safeties, obviously, during the, the kill of the year. But as far as corner goes, it was, you know, T. Shepard, I always give a little bit of love to. But as the Notre Dame followers know, in 2012, he was at Notre Dame for about three weeks. He was a top 25 guy and then disappeared because of, uh, you know, I guess some academic things that he couldn't get in. So he had to pack up his room and leave. But uh, Gary Gray, who was, ended up being a heck of a starter for Notre Dame back in 07 came in the Jimmy Clausen class. So it's been a long time that they've gotten an elite corner. I mean, that has been the, that's been the the white whale at Notre Dame for a long time here. So he's a guy, you know, we talked on his recruiting video and things of that nature, the importance, his length coming from a heck of a high school football program. He's a guy in this five should be able to get on the field early early you know obviously i love charles offensive lineman but he's a guy they could develop with some of the guys they already have in south bend for the next few years so i would go christian gray without a doubt and then number two the fastest kid on the block is micah bell i mean that's a return guy whether he plays d early as a freshman or whatnot get him the football opening kickoff against uh Ohio State next year in 2023 in South Bend. That that guy needs to return the first kick to kick off the season because 
Notre Dame hasn't had speed like him in ages. You know, I know they got Chris Tyree, but outside of Chris Tyree, who else have they signed in the last 10, 15 years that comparable with his 100 speed? Styles is pretty fast. Yeah, but someone said Bell. Was it a 10 1, 10 2? No, 100? there's no way. It's like 10 4. Was it 10 4? Yeah, okay. That's, I saw someone post a 10 1. I'm like, there's no way. That is yeah, like I think 10 crazy. 1 is like Olympic. Yeah, um, yeah exactly. 10, 10 4 is fast. Yeah. For a high school football player. High school junior. So uh, those are those are my two to play early, early. But uh, I know you want to talk about the guy probably up north in uh, California for playing time maybe as well. I don't know. Mm-mm. No, my, my pick would definitely well, – oh, yeah, yeah. Flores definitely yeah. can play early. But my pick for this would, yeah. would, would definitely be Christian Gray. Um, and, and we can pop on his tape here. But, um, yeah, he's – He's a freak show, man. And and I mean that as a complete compliment. Like he's just two words to describe him are twitchy and bouncy. Like he's just just got something to him that when you see him live, Look at that. like his movements are just very easy. Here's another really I mean, fast kid. Going into his junior year, he ran four four, I want to say it's four four two and a four four four, something like that, Ohio State. The and then a few days later in a four, four, nine at Notre Dame Ooh, in the 40 yard yeah. dash. Um, so, all right, Michael Morris. So uh, he said, Tim, you're in a 10, three, one. We'll, we'll take your word for it. Um, it's, it's blazing. Yeah, it's blazing. Yeah, <laughs> it's my, my, blazing so you got in Christian grace ran track. I think it was last year. Mm-hmm. His first time ever running a hundred meter first time. Ran like an 11-0. <laughs> it's like, good Lord. No training. No training. So Notre Dame has got really fast cornerbacks here. Tim, I, this might sound like an elementary question, but from a coach's perspective, like how important is speed to playing cornerback position? Is it re- just recovery speed, the kind of the main thing? Because, I mean, being able to cover – you know, a, a, a 10 yard out, a 12 yard curl. Mm-hmm. That's not so a whole lot of speed other than like closing. Speed. So is that the main part that makes speed really important at corner? No, that's a great point. Yeah. Just be able to break on the ball, you know, the chain, you know, the change kind of acceleration direction. exactly you know, rather than like track speed. Yeah, exactly. The ability to just, you know, change the direction, be able to plant your foot and, and break on a dime on the ball. That was a, you know, those great, you know, you know, SEC ones that we've seen in, uh, now his, you know, and it's funny cause you watch him, you know, he's just, I mean, you've met him. I mean, you've seen him in person, you know, he's listed at six one. Is he around that? Cause he just looks tall and long. And, um, you know, I, I you know, when I think of tall, long guys, he's not, you know, Bobby Taylor, the great one during the whole years who, you know, uh, outstanding, you know, football player, second round draft pick you know, to the Eagles back at, back in the nineties. And uh, he was one of the first guys reminded me of, cause he just looked tall, athletic, get the ball in his hands. You know, Bobby Taylor played corner safety, strong safety, could play anything. So Christian Gray just reminds me of one of those types of uh, football players that could just do so much for a defense. And then your question about the speed and you mentioned Micah Bell, you got, you know, Al Golden's what spent the last five, six, seven years, whatever it is in the NFL. And the NFL is just, so many situational packages and this check and this adjustment and you know, all the things that go on. And in the NFL, it's a billion man coverages. Everyone plays man all over the place with, you know, different techniques and shades and alignments and things of that. So I'm sure that went into a lot of this with Al Golden, like we got to get some speed if we're going to be attacking as you know, you and I have talked, I think eventually they're going to be a three, four hybrid type of a, a front seven, I think. With All the right. guys that they're recruiting. All right. We got some breaking news here. Holy crap. What's that? Dante Moore is announcing his commitment on Sports Center noon <laughs> Eastern on Friday. Wow. Sports. This Center. just in once to mention Dante Moore's graphic came from on three. You know, it's kind of cool. Um, that guy does a heck of a job, by the way. Hayes Fawcett, yeah, he started doing this when he was like 16. Yeah, yeah, yeah tough he's gig. um, just had an app on his phone, was doing edits for kids, and now he does this full time for for on three. Um, 
I mean, yeah. But that, besides the point, so there you go. Dante Moore announcing his commitment July 8th, noon on Sports Center. They don't carry many commitments. So that's uh, that's an interesting kind of note on this. Um, well, I mean, you, I mean, you talk about his recruitment, but for a guy, for me, just sitting back, you know, watching his recruitment, seeing what he does, and you know, he's not active on social media. He's the only interviews he's really done is if you talk to him at a seven-on-seven seven tournament. You know, he's not calling back reporters and you know doing a whole bunch of stuff. He's done a couple of YouTube things with some of the Michigan guys you know, beat writers and whatnot in his hometown, but uh, he's been pretty quiet, nonchalant, just doing, taking care of his business and <laughs> the dude's on ESPN. So uh, just classic. So um, obviously the rumors, but he's going to be going to uh, commit to Oregon is what all the, the picks are in. So uh, fascinating recruitment here over the last few months for him. Yeah. I take a peek at, uh, at everyone's favorites uh, on three prediction machine. Um, it's got him uh, trending towards Oregon at 72% A&M at 10%. I mean, look, I, I know there's going to be people who are like, Mike, you are an idiot. You got this one wrong. I did put in a prediction for him to land in Notre Dame in February. And I guarantee every single person listening to this would have done the same exact thing with the information that I was given. And uh, I would, I would do it 10 times again. So, no apologies on my end, but for um, recruiting is crazy. For, yeah, for the pick, yeah, it's recruiting. I don't like apologize for the pick, but if I had any um, role in getting Notre Dame fans heartbroken, I'm I'm sorry about that. Like, but here's what you got to remember. So yeah, you Notre Dame might not be landing, but I don't say more. But they're getting they got this guy CJ Carr, who's really darn good. <laughs> Uh, number 28 player, number five quarterback per the 2024 on three consensus. And while I'm told it's not, it's more likely that he sticks in the 2024 class than reclassifies the 23. Um, no, I mean, Notre Dame is going to get him eventually, you know, whether it's in, in 23 or in 24 and, uh, he's big time. So Tim, any, uh, any other thoughts before we move on? No, I mean, I love, I love CJ Carr. He is as accurate as, as there is. I mean, people, I mean, go back and watch his spring. He went to a couple of the elite 11 camps. He outperformed uh, the quarterback going to Tennessee, Nico, at one of the big camps down in Tennessee. I think it was Nashville, one of the national camps, and uh, outperformed him there, which was a bunch of great videos on YouTube people could watch. Uh, they're getting, hey, they're getting one great quarterback out of Michigan. They're getting, they're going to, you know, they're going to lose one, but. It's recruit, man. Notre Dame is Notre Dame is, you know, they battled. There's no doubt about that. All the the hype and all the the talk was about Dante. You could talk. You could probably write a 312 page book on the on his recruitment. And um, Rather I, mean, not. I mean, they've been. Yeah, I mean, but they've been on him since the pot of gold day. You know, the year before, and they've made an effort. So it's not for a lack of effort. It's not for a lack of phone calls. Not for a lack of Tommy. I mean, I mean, what did Tommy Reese go to his his high school, every opportunity he could during the recruitment in December, January, spring, he was there. And obviously yeah. they had the great visit a um, couple days there in December. So, I mean, excuse me, uh, when he visited what in March, I believe. And, um, yeah. But people forget right after that March visit, CJ Carr came a couple, what, about 10 days later. And that was the rumor where he left, told his parents, I'm committing. The, and they're like, whoa, whoa, let's just relax here. And he's like, no, I want to be, I want to go to Notre Dame. So. You know, and he didn't care who was going to be going there if Dante committed. CJ Carr didn't care. He was coming to ND. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. So as much as the again, assuming Dante ends up at Oregon, which is um man, sources I talked to are surprised that uh, you know, Oregon's the team to beat. It's just so much talk about him staying in the Midwest. So yeah. Oregon yeah, is a surprise. About that. Yeah. So Notre Dame had this hot streak of commitments. Um, and then you get they just got to stop recruiting guys with the last name more. You got Devin Moore, <laughs> Dante Moore, and um, and then Jason Moore is Jason announcing Moore. on on Sunday, yeah. So, um, oh, yeah, that's an elite defensive lineman in the 2023 class who is trending towards Ohio State. Um, yeah. so that's that's a, the, I mean, these are losses, these are these are losses, so. 
I mean, I probably sound like a whiny baby, but um, which I could probably stop there. Everyone's nodding their head, but um, I didn't. I don't love Notre Dame doing the the five commitments in six days thing. Like it, the couple of the commitments definitely were lined up right. well before oh, yes. they they told these kids told Notre Dame they're committing. But I feel like there was like maybe half of the five, like you know, two or three of the five were like. You know, no, I think Notre Dame kind of was like, all right, announce on the stakes. We want this hot streak. Yeah. I feel like I'd rather space it out a little bit more to offset the two mores, unrelated. But, you know, Jason and Dante yeah. pick, picking elsewhere. Because it's like you had this this high from the five commitments. And then it's like when those two guys, assuming they do commit elsewhere, that happens, it's it's going to suck. So Because, well, bo- I mean, bottom line, those are – you know, had those guys come aboard, you got those two with Keon Keeley, the three best players in the class. So, and uh, I, I mean, you know, I, I love Jason Moore. I've mentioned him a thousand times. The, the couple cover threes we've done re- on recruiting, you know, with all of us, I've always mentioned him as I, I truly believe he was a must get because his length, the combination, what he brings opposite with Keon Keeley. I know they're getting some good D linemen in the class, but they're not getting a Jason Moore. They're just not. And he is Ohio. Ohio State is gonna. You know, I was reading last night when all this started to come public. They're gonna. I mean, their D line is gonna be nice this year, recruiting wise. But uh, hey, Larry Johnson, one of the premier coaches in the country, he's he's restocking that deck up there. All right, we are going to get through a couple more segments. Make sure you guys hit the thumbs up um, on on this video if you are just joining us for the first time on uh, on, on one of our. Um, live streams. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and you can also head to blueandgold.com for more content um, covering um, Notre Dame football and recruiting. We got a couple more segments and then if you drop us a super chat we will make sure we get to that right away. We might have some time for some non-super chat questions at the end of the show. So Tim, you know I've been talking about this a lot. You know, I've been saying when Notre Dame gets to five commitments, yeah. we're going to compare 21 offensive line class, 22 offensive line class, and 2023 offensive line class. Are you ready to do that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this what, is going to be how a much, fun what, what kind of data, chat. what kind of research did you do here? Oh, wow. Just before you get into it, because I got a surprise for you. Well, you know what I did? I just went, you know, I went back to, you know, during the whole entire Kelly years. So I just went back to the last dozen years, obviously, and then plus 2023 20, and just wanted to see where this class ranked. So a couple Wait. of years, Notre Dame took three. A couple of years, they took yeah. two. Some years, five, six, big years. I just counted the top four. Because really, the last three years, Coogan, Ashton Craig, Joe Otting, love you guys. Wish you well at South Bend. But they're all one in the same, let's say. Okay? You you know, ranking wise. So I took them out and just focused on the big four. Before, before sure. you get into it, sure. I, I, I want to show you my surprise. All right? Well, I love it. Tim's always like, Mike, can you make a graphic for this? I'm like, Tim, I don't know where you think I have the time of the day, but I did. Ooh, so I made that. Tim, Tim's loving this right now. So I for again, podcast audience, you got to go get on, on our YouTube page. So I even got Blake Fisher, Billy Shrouth, and Charles Jags. So I all got their little faces on their little mugshot. So I'll read through the rankings real quick. Um, this 2021 class, you had Blake Fisher, number 55 overall player, number seven offensive tackle, Rocco Spindler. Number 70 overall, number four offensive lineman. You know what? This is a lot. I'm not going to read through 15 oh, yeah. rankings. Um, so podcast audience, I'm sorry. You just have to go to our YouTube page. Um, but Tim, so there it is on the screen, all the rankings. You mentioned Coogan, Craig, and Odding. Hey. 596, 498, 644, respectively. So they all it's, it's all fairly similar. Um, but yeah, what are yeah, so uh, I, all right? I so mean, now now you can now you can. I mean, I just did, yeah, I just did some third grade math and just you know, dropped the bottom five since it's three straight fives and went with the the next four. So, you know, I just tallied them up and see what the ranking is. So believe it or not, you know, the, if you go just the top four with their ranking, it's 2022. Yeah, Their average is, uh you know, 161. So 161, then you got the Fisher group is 204. And 2023 is 249 because, you know, Pendleton, you know, Page is the one that's extremely underrated. So, I you, agree. Know, you know, Pendleton's a bruiser. He's a mauler. He's a perfect, you know, he's going to be a 350 guy, I think, when it's all said and done. He's a heck of a football player. 
But uh, yeah, it's fat, you know, because the 2022 just has a bunch of dudes, those top top three that are just really, really high, high up. And uh, and what's fascinating, everyone always talks about 2021 and how alt's the fourth one out of that, you know, ranking wise. You know, you you know, people forget Caleb Johnson had what half the SEC, if not more, offered him. He was what at one time was it Florida or Auburn? Auburn. Auburn. Yeah, Auburn commit. So highly ranked guy. And um it's a it's a it's a great group. You got 15 really good football players, and um, and you gotta use the loose emoji breakdown, right? A third start, a third backup, and a third graduate and transfer on, basically. So and uh, be interesting how these guys really pan out because there are some dudes that could obviously Fisher and Alt are already there. You know, you know, how long do they stay at Notre Dame? Do they just kick butt in 22, 23 and take the money and go? Which then means Wagner, you know, Big Charles here in 2023. Who else emerges at tackle? Is it Sullivan Absher, Elijah Page? So um, this Caleb Johnson keep developing, gain some weight and go from there. So it's three damn good football classes with offensive linemen. Yeah. Yeah. So just looking at these rankings and for your average, you did do the consensus ranking, Tim? Yeah. Yeah. I use the consensus one just to, you know, yeah. keep on par with you so, and stuff like that. Yeah. 22 looks like the most well-rounded. Most, Yeah. But then uh, 23 is probably the most balanced because, you know, Odding is a true center. Pendleton's a right tackle in high school, but they've already told him you're going interior and he's cool with that. And then it's, you know, you know, Charles, you know, Jagasaw there is um perfect right tackle. Elijah Page is the left tackle. Sullivan Absher, if you beat one of those two out, you're a tackle. If not, you're gonna be a <laughs> you're gonna be a a heck of an offensive guard if that's where they move him. But the same with Charles. Charles has the makings to be a dominant dominant offensive guard if that's where he goes so three really good offensive tackles coming in 2023 to uh to prepare for after blake and joe alt finish their time so you think 2022 is too interior heavy probably when it's all said and done i liked you know ty chan is is you know obviously the fourth in the group some of his film from the all-star game he looked like he was just a. I mean he's a he's gonna be a big dude you know, he looks like the, an Aaron Banks type guy who's just going to yeah. keep getting bigger, be 325, 330, and just eat people inside. You know, you know, Billy Shrouf is a 100% guard. And then Emil, Emil Wagner, talent-wise, is people for, excuse me, forget just how athletic, man. You got to go back. I went back and watched his when I was doing this a couple days ago, and Emil Wagner's highlight film is freakish. He is so darn fast. If Emil Wagner was 290 pounds, he would have been a top, you know, 10, 15 consensus offensive football player. I truly believe this film is that athletic. There's plays where he's running 80 yards down the field with on, on screens and passes and running toe to toe with their skill guys. He is Emil Wagner is going to be awesome once they get that guy up to, you know, 290 pounds. Yeah, somehow we haven't really talked about Joe Alt yet, and I just wanted to say his name because hey, he's awesome. That's all. I told you after our spring game, and we did our spring uh, live show, our spring recap the following week as well. I, I thought Joe Alt was the best football player in the spring game. His film was outstanding. He he dominated in that game. He had no soft reps. He looked complete. His whole body looked completely redone from last season. He played with, you know, I told you before, I thought last year he didn't play. I don't I hate to use the word scared, but he just, he just, hey, Joe, go to the right. He goes to the right. He just was mechanical, did what he had to do. This year, he in the spring game, he played with a chip on his shoulder and was just knocking the hell out of dude. So I loved his development over the last six months, and it showed in the spring game. And Joe Alt's going to be an NFL. I mean, you got two NFL offensive tackles. How crazy is that in one class it's awesome Tim, i gotta i gotta i gotta take this phone call real quick yeah we need to get tim hyde fired he um just <laughs> said anything he just said something kind of slanderous towards joe walt so yeah, we gotta... <laughs> uh he was perfect last year no no but he I had a hundred grade on pff every single snap he uh no he was solid last year he didn't you know he had some nice blocks he wasn't you know but my god people forget he was a freaking block and tight end at purdue Couple of weeks later, boom! You're in the game, sec whole second half against Cincinnati in their NFL DN, and played outstanding. But I'm telling you, his spring game, 
I thought he was the best football player on the field that day. So he's going to, you know, in Ohio State, I, I, I'm, you know, we'll talk Buckeyes down the road, but the battle on the edges in that game, corner wide receivers and the DNs versus the offensive tackles on both sides in that game is going to be awesome. Awesome. It, NFL it, dudes on both sides. Yeah. Any other closing um, comments on uh, this offensive line breakdown? Obviously, you know, you don't need to, you know, pat mm-hmm. me on the back about my uh, graphic I made. I know it's fantastic, but any other, any other thoughts? Just real quick. I thought, uh, you know, cause like I said, I only, I only counted the top four and guess who the, the best O-line class during the Brian Kelly year, just by rankings, 2019 with uh, Zeke Carell, Christophic, and then you had John Olmstead uh, left immediately. And then obviously Quinn Carroll got injured early and, Never panned out that Minnesota now. So that's the the best ranking group during the, the Kelly year. So quite interesting how that panned out. Yeah. Mm. All right. Well, I, I'm curious your thoughts on this. Sure. Let's put 2021 aside. Twenty looking at those 10 and 22 and 23. Who's the best prospect? Because I feel like if we include 2021. There's, you know, yeah. we can't forget about what we saw from Fisher and all, even though limited sample size for Fisher, we know how to, good those are. So let's just put 21 aside. Who's the best offensive line prospect that Notre Dame signed in 2022 or, or you know, or looking at the 23 class and who they will sign? God, that's a great question right there. Look at uh, talent wise, but he needs work is obviously Wagner just because of his, you know, Tim, the, Tim, the best, the best Tim, give me a, give me a name. Come on. If I had one guy to, if I had one guy to start a, a team, yeah, I, I would take Emil Wagner. Yeah, just because okay. I think he's, I think he's a left tackle. You know, I know he's only two hundred sixty-five pounds. I'm talking, you know, when he's three hundred pounds, he's gonna get there. The kid ain't gonna stay two fifty-eight his whole life. Talent-wise, he's up there. You know, you know, Charles Jagasaw is a mauler. He will just eat you. He will devour you. He is violent as could be but his pass blocking is very very raw because he just puts his mitts on you and just pound you into the dirt but uh i just i loved emil wagner's film and uh and when he committed as you know that was a shocker times 10 dude right? I, I, mean, I was even watching yeah I had no idea i literally had no idea i texted a notre dame source that morning hey just checking just Meal's not going to Notre Dame, right? Like, nah. <laughs> yeah, that one was uh, that was a surprise. Yeah, yeah he's up until like two in the morning the night before trying to figure this thing out. I'm thinking to myself at that point, shouldn't you like say, "Hey, CBS, I'm sorry, I can't do this tomorrow." <laughs> oh man, that's uh, yeah. You know, and when I say a meal, it's you know, let's just say Blake and Joe, you know, do what they do, keep getting better, which they're going to do, and uh. So who's that guy that takes that first snap against Texas A&M? Emil Wagner is tailor-made to be that guy. Eat, rep, lift, 2022-23, get a couple reps here and there behind those two studs over the next couple years and um, go out against A&M as the, as the start and left tackle. That's, that's what I think is going to happen. Uh, you know, when you look at these 2022-23, what I'm thinking against uh, A&M in 2024. Emil Wagner be my guy. Give me Charles Jagasaw. I love him, man. He's that's what I'm going with. He you can't. I mean, you can't go wrong. No. I mean, I also thought about Absher because he's really darn good. But yeah, you can't go wrong here. Hey, re- yeah, and Charles is a two way guy. Never comes off the field. There's a couple polls with him from one of his uh, earlier years where I was like, my God, I did not see that coming. He's just. Uh, He's he's good, you know. Undefeated wrestler. There's some dudes in this class, man. Yeah. And then in these back to back classes, there's some dudes. I think of those fifteen. Let me pull back up. Elijah Page is the most undervalued. Oh, I, I, I mean, I watch him, and I'm like, holy crap! Like he looks like a, just a prototypical left tackle, like. And it's it's not a, a big projection. Like when you watch Joe Alt. Yeah. Like his junior film before he committed to Notre Dame, it's like, man, you, I can, I can put it together. Like I can see him blocking as a 
220 pound tight end at 6'6. Six, six. I can see it. The, it's the translation for Paige, he's 6'6, six, six, 300 pounds. I know. I know. So. He's, I mean, he's gained what 30 some odd pounds since his sophomore year. His sophomore film was solid. Elijah Page's junior film, he's a better knee bender. Pinnacle's, a, you know, really good high school out there in Arizona. Good football. He, I mean, he's, yeah, he's good. He yeah. really does. And I know, you know, the talk was, you know, Monroe Freeling, who's the higher ranked guy. But if you watch them without knowing who the heck's who, you're like, you know, and then you're like, well, that's Elijah Page. You're like, oh my God, that guy's unbelievable. He's, yeah. he's doing the same things Monroe's doing. Yeah. Um, I like this comment from Joey. Would love to see a Mike, Mike, and Tim show. I think there was a, a Mike, Mike, and Greg show last December when Kelly left. Oh, I was yeah, on we're, actually, with, yeah. we're doing a, a live show with uh, Goolsby tomorrow night. Okay, great. So um, I think I think we're going 8 p.m. Eastern for that one as well. Um, I would love to see a Mike, Mike, and Tim show as well. But the Definitely. thing is, we get two videos this way. So uh, <laughs> that's good. It's good, it's good for business. <laughs> Um, make, make you guys watch tomorrow as well or, or listen. So yeah, we would right. need three hours. We need a three hour show and, uh, yeah, that's pretty long for sure. Okay. So last segment here, I want to discuss, go back to conference realignment. We talked a little bit sure. about it, um, at the top of the show. Where do you want Notre Dame, Tim? We, uh, and if you just joined us, let us know in the comments, where you would like to see Notre Dame, whether it's independent, Big Ten, or some other conference, you want to see them go to the SEC. I'm pretty sure any conference would take Notre Dame at this point. They are the bell of the ball. What's your preference, Tim? Stay, stay, keep doing what they're doing. I don't, me personally, I don't think this is going to be two 30 team conferences and just gobble all these people up because if it was, it would be happening already. So especially after Texas and OU went last year, I think more dominoes would have went. Like the Big Ten's come out and said, SC, you know, we didn't call SC. They just called us saying, hey, it's contracts up. We want to get out of it on the 30th. Will you take us? Yeah, sure. Can we bring UCLA? And um, I think the, the you know, my first con you know, my first thought when I saw this and all so many Notre Dame people were losing their mind. I'm like, so Notre Dame's just going to throw away their entire existence because of a mediocre UCLA football program that's going to the Big Ten, and they're going to make some money. You know, fine. I think, I think Notre Dame's going to be fine. As we know, they're going to they're going to work this thing out. There's so many dominoes falling behind the scenes. I would love me personally. I wish Notre Dame would would put, you know, would play a cut, you know, ha, you know, why, you know, when the permanents came out with the ACC, I was, I was, first thing I looked at was Notre Dame. Why can't Notre Dame get a couple of permanents in there to, to keep their schedule going? You know, mine would be BC, for, you know, Goolsby went like that. I know he hates those guys, but uh, <laughs> you'll talk about that last tomorrow night, but that's your Eastern Catholic brother, you know, UNC, obviously because of the brand and recruit, recruit, recruit. And I'm a Miami guy. I wish Notre Dame would just start playing Miami each and every year and, and find a way to work that in with the ACC. So there's so many things. All this talk like, oh, Clemson's going to the SEC. Hey, this, you know, this grant of rights, the media package, this thing's been around for six, seven years. So it just didn't happen. So if Clemson and these guys were going to do that stuff with all these lawyers, they would have done it by now. And the money to leave the ACC is crazy. So – Something's going to happen. I know ESPN what owns ACC, so to speak, so they could probably rip up a contract if they wanted to, but uh, and bring you know Miami all the talk about Miami, Florida State, Clemson going into the SEC. If it happens, fine. Those guys are just going to knock the living hell out of each other and go eight and four every year, and then what? I mean, seriously, what's going to happen? Well, then they'll create their own national championship or something. But you know, and then you know, there's you know, there's two things. When the Big Ten first happened, I was like, great. Then let's make sure, you know, if Notre Dame jumped in, my first thought was end every year in L.A. Rose Bowl one year, Coliseum the next year, and just keep that going each and every year if that's if they're going to do that. Open every year with Michigan like the old days. Just get with your most hated rival, kick it off right now, and end every year in Los Angeles and then go for there. But And then as you start looking at it more, Notre Dame moving forward, one thing that is they're going to start doing more and more of is they got SEC contracts with teams coming up. 
Arkansas, A&M, Alabama. They already got Florida. They could get an SEC contract in a heartbeat. So I hope Notre Dame – I I would love to see them get a couple hard ACC games on the schedule each and every year. SC, USC is going to be their Big Ten game. And then just have an SEC team each and every year coming up. So that would be my take. And then, you know, I am all in on a, playing a – FCS team each and every year. Heck, everyone else oh, does it. Geez. Hey, I've, I've changed my tone. Who cares, right? Everyone else is doing it. So knock one of those in and there's your 12 games. So I don't think me personally, uh, just real quick, is is this, oh, Notre Dame's going to get blocked out. There's no way in the yeah. world any conference is going to say, sorry, Notre Dame. Never. No one, will, that will never happen. No, Pete Dammel said it best. He was like, the SEC is going to do whatever it can to help Notre Dame because they don't want them going to the Big Ten and helping the Big Ten with more money and more fame and prestige and all that stuff. So the SEC is going to do everything in their power to help Notre Dame stay where they're at. So, hey, stay where you're at. Keep being Notre Dame and let the chips fall where they go. And gonna All have right, some Tim, great Tim I got to cut you off, man. You're Go getting on. like five minutes of runtime. Go My ahead, Mike's got to talk too. Jeez. I'm just messing with you, too. All right. Starting three, appreciate the super chat. K Nasty says, let's not forget we're going to get crucified for not joining a conference. And then Ryan says they've been crucified for years. And I'll add, Notre Dame's going to get crap from the national media no matter what because people – man, I, Tim, I had a, a, someone really did not like my comment. I don't know if it was what show it was that I talked about um, that the country doesn't like Notre Dame. Are we living under a rock? Like you either love Notre Dame or you do not like Notre Dame. There's not much in between. So exactly. it really like conference, no conference, what the nation thinks about it. I really don't give a crap. Neither should Notre Dame. No. Here's what I do think on this. I, I'm a, I'm of the opinion that I don't have a strong one between the independents and the Big Ten. I, I, I see pros and cons with both. I think Notre Dame going to the Big Ten would be really good for my business. That's for sure. It'd be we're very much in the interesting business. That would be interesting as hell. But just the Marcus Freeman area era is very interesting. So we're we're enjoying that. But here's what I will say that I have a strong feeling about. Get rid of the ACC five game deal. I am tired of it. Notre Dame playing Duke. Oh, great. Oh, NC State. Georgia Tech, a down Florida State. Oh, we got Pitt. I, I, it's, it's just not doing it for me. Maybe when all those teams in their heyday, it, it's great. But right now, eh. now if we're talking like five games versus the Big Ten, USC. What if Oregon and Washington get in there? Michigan, Ohio State, Michigan State. Penn State, are you kidding me? You can tell me you wouldn't be fired up about that. So Notre Dame keeps its independence, but then still has a scheduling deal where they get five Big Ten games a year. I mean, what's the the bottom of the Big Ten? What, Rutgers, Maryland? Um, you can tell me that that's, that's middle of the road. ACC program. It's not like yeah. there's going to be some big drop-off. So that's what I'm for, Tim. I'm, I'm again. I'm fine with independence. I'm fine with Big Ten. Um, but what I would like to do, if, if Notre Dame was somehow able to get out of the ACC thing and go to the Big Ten, um, on, on like a you know five games, that that would be what I'm for. And, and you know, real quick on that, that's why I said Notre Dame. If you know, because obviously ACC, all their other sports are in it, and basketball and all those great, you know, baseball just had a great run in the ACC and World Series. That's why I said Notre Dame instead of this, like you're saying, round robin playing some of these schools and stuff like that. Pick a couple, you know, pick a few and just play them each and every year. And that's your ACC schedule. That's, you know, that's, that's why I wish, you know, Dr. Jack would do and, and just be like Miami for nostalgia because Miami is going to be back soon. I love UNC. It's you got two of the big brands and then recruit Notre Dame loves that area. And then BC, BC and Notre Dame. It was, I mean, they should play each and every year. The fact that they don't and they're in the ACC is ridiculous. So I would just have a couple of those games. The rest of the ACC, go play who you are. Don't even worry about Notre Dame. And uh, and branch out even more. Play some more Big Ten, like you're saying. And uh, 
And the key is the SEC. I think they need to keep an SEC every year. Every two years, home and home, which they're going to be doing coming up here, and just keep that going each and every two years. Just go right through the SEC and, and play all those uh, guys and have a good relationship with those guys moving forward. But if you're going to do that, recruit, recruit, recruit. You better just keep knocking these guys out of the park. Well, Tim, I haven't seen any nasty comments on YouTube yet about my rant. So that probably means that uh, people haven't heard it yet or um, they're they're about to. And, and they're about to. Um, so I think it's a, with that in mind, it's probably a great time to sign us off. But, Tim, I always want to just, just give you an open floor if there's anything else you want to discuss before sure. we sign off. Yeah, just I mean, I'm just reading some of the comments. One of the guys says it's going to be difficult as an independent. How? They, they've been to a couple Final Fours. They went to the national championship in 2012. They were, you know, a, a, a play away in, in 2015. You know, they don't blow the Stanford game. It's more game. difficult I mean, they have they've to been... go undefeated. What's that? It's more difficult just, I mean, they have to go undefeated. They, Notre Dame independent really is not going to be able to get as one loss. That's, I think that's the point. True, but but if, they, but if there is a one loss, it's going to be like last year. If Georgia takes care of Alabama and the SEC and plays – they're the best defense in the history of the world. Notre Dame's in the final four. How crazy is that last year? So, but then what about like the 12 team playoff? Where does that fit in? Yeah. Well, the 12, if there, if there's a 12 team playoff, cause I mean, it's funny. I was reading some of the articles was uh, Jack Swarbuck. He did in the last couple months, you know, and one of them was with Pat 40 and he just said, we're going to 12. It's going to happen. So there is going to be a 12. So if there's a 12, then Notre Dame's going to get, have a shot. Oh, yeah. At 11 yeah, and if you're 10 and yeah. two. 11 and one, as long as you're 10 and two, you're not getting destroyed or, you know, you lost to Navy, you know, yeah. you're going to get in. Notre Dame's going to have a seat at the table and that's the big thing. All right. Well, fun show. We got through everything. So Tim, I appreciate your time. Always. Notre Dame fans. It was a, a fun show. We had a great audience tonight. Lots of good discussion. So um, if, if you're just joining us live, make sure you just like, you can listen back via podcast, which is not my number one preference. Go watch the beginning of the the, the uh, replay of the video. Uh, check it out. And, um, yeah, we will be back next Wednesday with Tim Hyde um, and Ashton Pollard. Thursday night I'll have a show with Mike Goolsby. We'll talk about some of these same topics. He wants to talk Notre Dame recruiting. I'm sure I'll have some opinions on um, the conference realignments. Um, so, yeah, make sure you check us out with the, the former Notre Dame captain and linebacker, 8 p.m. Eastern time on Thursday. So appreciate you guys and we will catch you next time.